You'll see on the screen this evening that BirdLife South Africa is offering a membership discount of 15% if you sign up with BirdLife South Africa up until the end of June, I believe. So that'll, you can reach out to our membership team over the next few weeks and use the DreamBirds hashtag to um, when you put in your membership form and that will allow you to qualify for that 15% discount on our membership. You also see an advert for Conservation Conversations, which is a weekly webinar series that BirdLife is running. So if you enjoy tonight's uh, showcase, please do hop on over to the Conservation Conversations website. Great, so this evening I am joined by Brent Dixon, who is Dream Resorts and Hotels Chief. We've also got Herman Vandenberg, who is the developer of the Bird Pro app, and my colleague Andrew DeBlock, who is AV Tourism Program Manager at BirdLife South Africa. So welcome to all of you, and I'm going to hand over to Brent just to welcome all of us this evening. Thanks, Melissa. Hi, everyone, and um, guys, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, yeah, and welcome to our first Dream Hotels and Resorts birding webinar. Uh, we're very excited to be co-sponsors with BirdLife South Africa and BirdPro for tonight's discussions. Um, Dream Hotels and Resorts has a variety of over 20 properties across Southern Africa, which are in unique destinations, um, very often off the beaten track or in remote locations. And as such, our resorts and lodges are often located in fantastic birding destinations, um, each offering their own distinctive habitats and associated birding experience. So this association with BirdLife and BirdPro ties 100% into our philosophy of providing guests with more than just holidays, but rather besp uh, bespoke experiences. Um, many of our properties are listed on BirdLife South Africa as bird friendly, bird friendly establishments. Um, and I know most of us, especially our city dwellers, are desperate to get out and do some twitching. So when we can, we'd love to host you and uh, please support Herman by buying the BirdPro app and on your next birding outing or outing or join um, uh, or join as a member of BirdLife SA. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the bird experts, Melissa, Andrew and Herman. Thanks guys and guys, everyone please enjoy. Okay, good evening everybody and thank you so much for joining us this evening. We are very proud to bring you a joint webinar sponsored by Dream Hotels and Resorts, BirdLife South Africa and the Bird Pro app. Tonight I am going to be presenting with Andrew de Bluck and Herman Vandenberg. My name is Melissa Howes Whitecross and I represent BirdLife South Africa. Andrew is also from BirdLife South Africa and Herman is representing the Bird Pro app. So it's wonderful to be with all of you tonight and we're really excited to take you on a bit of a birding journey this evening, highlighting some of the amazing regions to find South Africa's birds. Now BirdLife South Africa is South Africa's only conservation NGO that is dedicated to the conservation of birds and their habitats in particular. We do this through scientifically based programs that support the sustainable and equitable use of natural resources. But one of our main mission points is really to encourage people to enjoy and value nature. And that's something that we hope by the end of this webinar, you will certainly be doing if you are not already an avid nature fan. Now, just to give you some context of conservation in South Africa when it comes to our birds, we have 132 threatened bird species, according to the IUCN conservation red list status within the region of Southern Africa. And unfortunately, 85 of those are considered highly threatened. We have 13 critically endangered species. So that means species that are on the brink of going extinct. And many of those are actually our vulture species, which we'll be telling you a little bit more about later on in this webinar. We also have what's called an important bird and biodiversity areas program. So this highlights a number of key sites across South Africa, and you can see all of those red zones on the map that are really important for the conservation of our birds. And we're working very closely with a number of different partners across South Africa to ensure that those key sites are also protected so that our key species are able to survive. Just some background on our organization. We've been around for many, many years. We're quite a small team. We have around 40 full-time staff members who work very, very hard across South Africa, making sure that we can conserve our birds and their habitats and also bring people closer to nature. So the BirdLife International Partnership is made up of 123 country partners around the world. And what's really important about being part of this family is that the lessons we learn here in South Africa and the lessons that our co-partners learn across the world can be translated to each other through this partnership. 
So together we are stronger and we learn a lot more and we can have a much bigger impact in the conservation space. We are the biggest global partnership for nature and people and we're very proud to be a part of this family. BirdLife South Africa itself is a membership-based organization and we offer a number of different things for our members. We have the African BirdLife magazine, which comes out every two months. So there are six issues a year. We also have a weekly webinar called Conservation Conversations, which runs every Tuesday night. Members get sent a monthly e-newsletter that's full of interesting facts about some of the work that we're getting up to and some of our events that are coming up. And we have close to 60 different bird clubs spread out across South Africa. We're heavily involved in environmental education and making sure that we can bring exciting conservation initiatives to the youth of South Africa. We run an annual flock excursion, which is often linked to our AGM. And this takes birders all over the country, as well as into the Southern Ocean with our flock to Marion cruise scheduled for 2021 in January. We also have the Learn About Birds Conference, where we showcase some of the most cutting edge science and also exciting popular bird talks for our members. And lastly, we have a fantastic AV tourism program, which Andrew, who's speaking to us tonight, is actually in charge of at BirdLife South Africa. And this really does showcase just how important birds are in driving our economy forward and uplifting the lives of our community guides who are stationed across South Africa. We are a membership organization, as I said, and we'd like to offer all of you watching this evening a 15% discount on membership. When you register, please just use the Dream Birds hashtag on your registration form and you will receive that 15% discount. All the information about our membership can be found on our website and we'll post those details at the end of the webinar. We hope that some of you will consider becoming members of our amazing conservation organization after tonight. So just before we get to the three Dream Resorts locations that we're gonna talk about, I just want to take this opportunity to show you some of the functions that we've got in the new BirdPro app. So BirdPro is a new bird app that was launched last year. You've got three options. There's a free download version, which is the evaluation version. It contains 100 common birds. And then you can upgrade to the Kruger Park version or the South African version. The app has got all the basic functions that you would expect from a bird app. You can go into the details of a bird and you can see the images can go to the distribution information about the bird, calls, and you can also add your own sightings. In terms of the images, we try to add as many images as possible. Um, we've tried to include images from the front, from the back, from the side. Also, if there are different races or different things that you need to point out. Um, in flight, we are applicable images. Um, and we've also got quite a neat feature that you can view the actual size of the eggs. Most of the images have got extended captions and that helps you especially in birds that are hard to distinguish from other birds just to point out what to look out for. In terms of the distribution, BirdPro uses data from the South African Bird Atlasing Project. This is a project that contains millions and millions of records of where birds have been seen in the country. And we've written an algorithm that translates this data into distribution maps. The purple area is the distribution and you can also drag it to show the different distributions throughout the year. The algorithm is, is quite sophisticated in that it takes the density of sightings in a specific location and determines how tight or how accurate the data is at that point. So in places where there's lots of atlasing activity, the maps almost appear more granular because you know you've got a high confidence level in the data that you've got and it's pretty accurate. In places where there's little atlasing activity like here in northern Zimbabwe, if you find a sighting somewhere, the chance is good that it does occur in the surrounding areas, although the data doesn't necessarily reflect it but our algorithm actually spreads out this distribution in these areas. In terms of the text, BirdPro contains quite extensive information about the bird. In fact, if you add all the words together, it adds up to more than the Lord of the Rings, including the Hobbit. What is quite special is that we've got this extended text sections that were written by some of the most renowned birders in South Africa. This contains all the additional information that you would need to appreciate this bird and it also includes some anecdotes from the authors. 
it is an easy read and really enjoyable. In terms of the calls, we've got over 1,700 calls. We try to add as many different variations of the calls that you could lay your hands on. And they are also labeled, which helps you to identify the different variations of songs in different areas. Then on the sighting side, you can see your list of sightings, but you can also add a sighting. And here you can add your trip, you can add notes, you can even add photographs. And then you can also sync your sightings across different devices. This also uploads the sightings to a website where you can do some further filtering and sharing of sightings. But the one thing that makes BirdPro quite special is the smart search function. So the smart search function is the place that you would go to to help you identify a bird. Here you've got different options, shape and type, size, colors, etc. So let's take an example. Let's say you've seen a bird that wades in the water. It's got black and white feathers. So if you go to the results, you'll see that now you've got 78 birds and the black and white waders are all displayed at the top. There are further options down lower, but these are not as good a match as the first 10 that you've seen there. So it does actually give a probability match against your selection criteria. Another very important function is the location filter. Now, because we've got these accurate distribution maps, it means that this is a very efficient way to filter down the birds that are in a specific location. I'm just going to select a location as an illustration. Let's select Finford Lake. And you can see there are 336 birds found at Finford Lake. There's also a special section for the hard to identify birds. So we've got three categories there, the all brown raptors, the LBJs, and the nightjars. So these are sections where there are very specific selection criteria which helps you to identify these difficult birds. When you go into the details of the results, you are also able now to remove species from the list that you think are not a good match. So that allows you to only be left with the birds that you think are the probable matches and then compare them side by side. In terms of additional settings, you can change your languages. You, we've got quite a few primary languages and secondary languages. Most of the indigenous as well as European languages are here. Um, and you can also change the way that you group your listings. You can also sync your sightings and use a large font for those like me that need glasses to read. In terms of your sightings, uh, we've got a sightings list which will list all the sightings that you've logged. You can filter this list by your trip and then you can also sync your sightings with a website and you can visit this website and this is where all your sightings from all our apps will be combined now. So if you have the tree app or you have the dragonfly app, they will all be displayed on the same map and you'll be able to view all the sightings and also share this with friends. Well that's about it from the bird pro side. We're gonna go over to Andrew now, who's going to start the virtual tour. So our first destination tonight is the Finfoot Lake Reserve. It's about 90 minutes northwest of Pretoria and Johannesburg. It's in the greater Pillensburg area near Sun City. And yeah, it's a convenient uh, bushveld escape for any cloud hangers. And it's phenomenally set up. I mean, there's a conference center for 60 people, a lovely swimming pool, spa, offer game drives. As you can see on the bottom right, they offer sunset boat cruises, which I think look phenomenal. And what I'm most keen to try out when I eventually get there is the Segway safaris. That's something pretty unique I haven't seen offered elsewhere. The lodge is a thatched resort set in a pretty lush woodland which means that the birds and the animals are all around you, even when you're in camp, which gives you a really nice bushveld experience. The primary habitat is bushveld, but the special thing about Finfoot Lake Reserve is that it's at the, the nexus or connecting point of two pretty contrasting systems in the moist kind of low felt bushveld, which is what you see in the photograph there, but also the drier, more arid Kalahari areas. If you ask any birders how to up your species list, the answer is to go to as many habitats as possible. And Finfoot uh, Lake Reserve really offers that in abundance. As you can see on the, the bottom right, they have access to that lake as well, which gives you a few water birds to add to your list. 
And on the left, I think even sitting at that gorgeous poolside, you could uh, snag a few species for sure. Let's uh, have a look at the important species you can see there. The way that we're going to present the birds for you in these different areas is actually using the BirdPro app. So I've made a little lists. I've used the sightings functionality just to filter down to the species that we want to talk about. We try to identify the birds based on um, their uniqueness and, and also in some cases where they are unexpected at the different locations. So Andrew, I think you're up first with African Finfoot, aren't you? Yes, so the bird that gives Finfoot Lake Reserve its name. I don't know if my fellow panelists would agree with me, but I reckon this is probably in the top three birds in the country. Um, it's seen as one of the holy grails of birding. And the reason for that is that it is so unbelievably unique, but also so damn elusive. They are really skulky, so they hide away in riverine vegetation. You can see one swimming out in the open on this photo, which is totally not typical by my experience. <laughs> um, this is a, one of my favorite birds also because it was my 600th species in South Africa. So it means something to me. So this is the female picture here. You can see it looks a little bit different to the male, which is that slate gray one that we saw beforehand. And here's another picture of the female. So you can see why they're called fin feet. These enormous bright orange feet stick out when you see them walking on the edges. So the next species that we're going to tackle is a greater bushrike. Um, this bushrike is quite special because it's, it's the only bushrike in Africa that, that actually prefers the bushveld or the drier bushveld. Um, and it is quite a heavy bird. Uh, what's interesting is that there's one case where a bird was carrying its own weight in flight. It's about 75 grams and the mouse that it caught was 74 grams. So it's, it's an extremely strong bird. It's got an extremely strong beak. It loves eating little chicks, but mostly invertebrates. But what's really interesting about them is the call. I love the call and I love the Afrikaans name, which is spookful, which is directly translated as the ghost bird. And this is how it sounds. I agree with you, Herman. They really are thugs. I've seen great video clips of them taking on little snakes and lizards in Kruger. And unfortunately, the reptiles normally come off second best once that hook beak gets in, a hold of them. Okay, so the next bird we're going to do is a pygmy kingfisher. I think uh, Herman used the word heavy to describe the grey-headed bushrike. This is certainly not a heavy bird. They're only 12 centimeters long and they're the smallest of our 10 kingfisher species. Something that uh, some of you may not know is that only five of our 10 kingfisher species in South Africa actually eat fish. So this is one of the examples where it's actually more of a, a bush felt bird than a riverine or uh, aquatic bird. They will eat mainly invertebrates and small little reptiles like geckos and skinks. But mostly I think my experience of this bird has been a multicolored bullet shooting through acacia woodland. Um, so if you, you can obviously see they are very pretty little things, um, but absolutely tiny. Um, so you often see them in flight and you, you've got to be pretty quick with your binoculars to get onto them once they've perched. Because even though they're so bright, uh, they can be quite difficult to spot once they've um, taken up a perch. Mm. Yeah, well, some of the better views I've had of them is um, out in Zululand when we were driving along the forestry plantations. They use the little um, sandbanks up against the edges of the plantation blocks to build their little mud nests and cavities. So if, you, if you're lucky enough to manage to find one of their muddy nest holes, you have a much better chance of actually watching them a little bit closer. But I agree with you, beautiful jewels flitting through the undergrowth is normally how you get to see these guys. The next bird we're going to talk about is a fairy flycatcher. Now we were just talking about those tiny kingfishers and this little guy weighs in at a mammoth six grams. They are teeny tiny and one could easily mistake them for their namesake of the fairy. But what's really special about these beautiful little birds is that they are what we call altitudinal migrants. So during our winter months, these birds will come up onto the high felt and they're pretty prevalent right across, um, particularly enjoying those acacia or fine leaf species of tree. 
and in the summer months they will move back down towards the Karoo and the Western Cape. We call this one a, the masked bandit down in the Cape. So my my experience is it has mostly been out in the Karoo and the Tonkwa Karoo and um, it's quite a sought after species close to Cape Town so quite a lot rarer. So I'm quite jealous that you you get it in your gardens up in Gauteng. That seems a little unfair. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen one in my garden by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Nor me sadly. No acacia species in my garden. <laughs> so the next bird we're going to talk about is a marigold stalk. I was actually quite surprised to find out it's, um, it does occur there at the Finfoot Lake. It is on the edge of its distribution there. Um, but it is quite an interesting bird. It's probably a good contender for one of the most ugly birds in South Africa. Um, I normally associate it with the Kruger Park where I've seen it many, many times. They don't have any feathers on their neck and, and their head because they often are associated with carcasses as well. Um, so probably for the same reason that the vultures don't have feathers on their necks and faces. Yeah, and they're also a species that uh, likes to defecate on their legs to help cool themselves off, much like the vultures do as well. So you can see those very pale white legs. That's not just coloration from their skin necessarily. They do defecate on their legs to try and cool off. One of the apt nicknames I've heard for this bird is the undertaker. They have this very upright stance and it's almost like they've got their, their hands behind their back kind of solemnly standing in a funeral with their, oh. their black suit and white shirt. Um, and it, it's kind of apt because obviously they're, they're at carcasses alongside vultures and that's it. It's almost like they're attending a funeral. I quite like that nickname. So the next bird is the purple roller. Yeah, so these guys are the biggest of our roller species. They come in at 33 centimeters and weighing in at 168 grams. And I believe their Afrikaans name is the Groot Thropunt for very good reason. They're lilac breasted roller cousins that are the more sort of well known and recognized of the rollers only weigh in at 108 uh, grams. So these guys have 60 grams on them and they certainly are very large rollers and you can pick them up really easily, particularly when you're driving along the roads that have telephone poles and wires. They often like to sit out in the open, keeping an eye for insects and lizards running along the grass and the, the sort of dirt tracks. And they'll then drop down and catch them and fly back up and eat them. That's a feeding scheme known as hawking. Now rollers, I think, are, are probably one of the most photographed species in South Africa just because they're so beautiful and colorful. I don't know if you two have noticed that often when you pull up to rollers, if you're in a game reserve and you pull up in the car to take a photograph, they're often really badly positioned in terms of the sun. So they're often very backlit by the sun. Probably eight out of 10 times you see a roller, it's between you and the sun, which is terrible for, for photography, but there's a good reason for that. Um, as Melissa said, that they're, they're hawkers, so they sit on a perch and hunt from a perch. You know, the reason you can't see them that well is because of the sun, and that's also because their prey often is on the roads, which are quite warm um, compared to the surrounding environment. So they're actually using the sun as a method to obscure themselves from their prey, which increases their hunting success. The next species would be the greenback camaroptera. This greenback camaroptera is, is uh, also known as the bleating warbler um, as a result of its call. And there's people that use different names for these birds depending on which taxonomy they've subscribed to and how updated their bird books are. Um, this is mostly found in quite lush kind of woodland or, or forest um, and they have these calls that kind of sound like laser beams going off, these very staccato calls that uh, you, you often hear from quite high up in the canopy and you'll see these shapes darting around in the, in the shadows. Um, but they're very territorial, so if you spish or anything like that, so spishing is making a, a noise with your mouth that sounds like an alarm call, like a psh, psh, psh. These birds will come in closer to see who's on their turf, which is quite fun. Okay, the next bird is a lesser flamingo. Great, so lesser flamingos are one of our most charismatic birds. I think uh, you can thank 1950s America for really making the flamingo a famous icon of uh, humanity. And unfortunately, our, our lesser flamingos are considered near threatened, so they're not doing too well. And they have a really interesting breeding distribution. So here in Africa, 
there are only four known breeding sites for lesser flamingos. Uh, the three sort of major sites that are well known are Lake Natron, uh, Suapan in Botswana, and Lake Natron's in Tanzania, and of course, Etosha Pan in Namibia. And a couple of years ago, our BirdLife CEO, Mark Anderson, and his wife were heavily involved in establishing a new breeding distribution just outside of Kimberley. And this is in the Campus Dam area. So they set up a wonderful artificial breeding platform for these birds in the middle of the lake. And they took to it really, really well. And the birds have been successfully breeding there for a number of years. And I believe this year we had a, a bumper breeding event. So great to see that with a little bit of conservation intervention, we've been able to create a sustainable breeding population here in South Africa. And we hope that this breeding population will continue for a long time to come. Really gorgeous birds. You can see the little juvenile there, not as beautiful as mommy and daddy, but uh, definitely stunning filter feeders with that nice beak, just weeding out little plankton and algae from the water to keep themselves going. So the next bird we're gonna discuss is the very interesting bird for me is a greater painted snipe. And the, the reason why it's always interesting to me is in most birds, the male is a fairer of the species, but the greater painted snipe, it's actually amazing how they differ and how the female is actually the more striking of the two. You see, this is the, this is the female and this is the male. Interesting thing that I read about snipes, the word sniper is is derived from, from the hunting of these birds because of the way that they fly. They fly a zigzag and it was a big chip on your shoulder if you were able to shoot it. So, so that's where the word sniper comes from. Yeah, they're really striking birds and they, you'll find them on the, the edge of kind of marshy pans or in the case of Finford Lake along the edges of the lake. Um, areas where you have a little bit of uh, vegetative growth next to the to the lake, that's where you should look for them and a little bit of mud for them to hunt through. Um, these birds are also well known for turning up in very odd places. So I actually had my lifer. So a lifer is a bird that you've seen for the first time. Um, birders have their own whole language. Um, so we'll try and clarify terms as we go through. But I had my lifer in, in the Kalahari Desert. We had one bird at a, a waterhole in the Kalahari National Park, um, and that was actually my life. Uh, but uh, I've seen it a few times since in areas where it is supposed to be. But you know, birds don't read the books, so they don't know where they're supposed to occur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that really speaks to their wetland nomadic behavior, where they'll just seek out these sort of seasonal pans that turn up all over the place and take advantage. Okay, next we're going to tackle the, the owl species that you can find at Finfoot. What's interesting is that they've got Six of the owl species of South Africa, you can actually find it. It's just actually quite a, a large number. So we're gonna start off with a wonderful pearl spotted owlet. Great, so the, the pearl spotted owlet's probably um, one of the first owl species that people encounter during the daytime. These are very small, uh, they're called owlet because they're part of the Glacidium group of owls. So really small um, diurnal hunting owls. And you can see those very, very sharp, tiny claws. These guys, despite their size, are vicious predators. And they're probably most well known for their call, which is really good at attracting in what we call a bird party. So as a birder, when you are trying to lure in many different birds, um, often what people do is take out their phones and put on the call of the pearl spotted owl. And this often draws in lots of your smaller bird species, what we call the bush alarm system. So other birds trying to warn each other that there's a potential predator in the midst and they will all come together and try and mob off that predator. So of course, if your speaker is the predation threat, they'll be drawn into where your speaker is and you, it's often a good way of trying to see many different species. We do encourage the use of playback in a responsible manner. So please don't harass too many of our birds using this technique but it is a technique that a lot of birders do use to try and draw out birds from their hiding spaces. There's two eyes to try and help them look like they've got eyes in the back of their head and ward off any larger predator species. Then the next owl species, African grass owl. Yeah, so I'm gonna introduce another birding term. I mentioned that we have our own language. This is what we call a bogey bird, uh, for Melissa at least. Um, so a bogey bird <laughs> is a bird that you have tried for many, many times and 
has brought you to your wits end and frustrated you because you've never been able to lay eyes on us. Now, this is a very tricky bird to see because it's very secretive. They breed in very long grass and other vegetation um, and you will only really see them flying around at dusk and dawn. So yeah, Melissa, I don't know how you feel about this bird. It is, it is a very beautiful it's a beautiful bird, but as you say, a hell of a frustrating one. I think my most desperate attempt to date was a 3 a.m. departure for Sekabos Rant Nature Reserve on New Year's <laughs> Day two years ago. And uh, I went up and down the Indracht Road, which is one of the spots where you can supposedly see them. We had 11 marsh owls on that drive, but by 7 a.m. when the sun was blazing high, we had not seen tail or feather of an African grass owl. So my quest continues and hopefully one of these days I'll break this bogey curse. <laughs> the facial disc in owls is there to amplify sound and to allow them to work out exactly, they can pinpoint where sound is coming from. Um, they almost use it like a satellite dish for honing in on prey, which is quite impressive. It is, and their ears are actually asymmetrically placed on their heads to help them pinpoint exactly where they're flying. And when they fly over you, they are completely silent. They have these amazingly adapted feathers to make absolutely no sound when they fly so that their prey doesn't hear them coming and they're able to hear their prey up ahead. And the most beautiful chicks that you can think of. <laughs> <laughs> they're rivaling the Marabou stalks there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And they've also got a quite an interesting call, a very screechy sound, which I've heard. And you often hear them without seeing them. Yeah, it can be the stuff of nightmares when you're late at night alongside a wetland and that screech comes flying past. <laughs> and then the last of the owls that we're going to discuss is the white-faced owl, the sudden white-faced owl. Yeah, so this is another beautiful um, owls, also one of the smaller ones that we've got and very much associated with those dry thorn felt habitats. Um, beautiful orange eyes with that white, striking white facial disc and the black outline. Um, really strange uh, sighting occurred in Santon where one of these birds established itself in a park just outside of Santon in Johannesburg. So very odd record for that one. Typically you find them out in the proper bush felt north of Pretoria, but um, really gorgeous little birds. And yeah, I'm lucky to see one if you, if you manage to connect with them. That's their cryptic pose. So if you find them roosting during the daytime, they'll up and pull into this very cryptic pose where they look like a tree branch, um, not as striking as they are at nighttime when they have their eyes open and those white discs showing clearly. Alrighty, our next lodge is the Little Switzerland Resort, which is situated in the foothills of the beautiful northern Drakensberg. And it is really one of the most pristine grassland areas. You can see in that photograph these rolling hills covered in stunning grassland. And in between all of these hills, you get these beautiful cliffs or crevices that are filled with wonderful misbelt forest that is host to a number of really special birds, the likes of your Cape parrots, and of course, the beautiful blue swallows come and live across some of these wonderful misbelt grasslands that are in the region. There's also a number of incredible places to go hiking out of the resort. And um, those of you who enjoy a good day's walk, there are a number of different trails that you can go and participate in. And of course, just the, the beautiful scenery of the Drakensberg Mountains all around you. This really is a special place to visit. Obviously, seasonally, your summertime is going to be better for birds. Um, you get all the summer migrants coming through, the grasslands are nice and green and the birds are breeding. And of course, if you are okay with handling some really chilly weather, if you go through in winter, you can still access all of the really special endemics and resident birds that we're going to show you in just a moment. But you'll definitely need to bring a beanie and a warm jacket if you're going to go in winter. So let's take a look at some of those incredible grassland specials and we're going to kick off with one of my absolute favorites, the secretary bird. We shouldn't have favorites, but uh, I've always admired the supermodels of the birding world. I mean, just look at those legs and that beautiful hairdo, but that beautiful crest of feathers on top of their heads. Secretary birds are really our flagship species for open landscapes like the grasslands. So they need that nice open space to hunt. They use those very long legs to stride across the grasslands and deliver pinpoint accurate high force punches to whatever prey they come across. They'll eat a variety of different things. But despite being famed for their ability to eat snakes, these birds actually eat around 86% of their diet 
using locusts and different species of beetles. So they're actually far more reliant on insects than they are on snakes and other prey items, but they will pretty much eat whatever they can catch. Really stunning birds. Sadly, we're seeing major declines across the entire range. And uh, we're hoping not to, not to see these birds disappear from our landscapes in the future. They really are under a lot of threat. Is it true that it gets its name from the um, feathers that stick out from the back of the head, Melissa? Yeah, so the 1800s English secretaries, which happen to be gentlemen, not ladies, as they are in more <laughs> modern times, but uh, the gentlemen of the 1800s used to wear these long black legging pants, as you can see on the bird there, and they used to put their feathered quills, which they used to write with behind their ears, and that appearance gave them very much the similar appearance of a secretary bird. So that is one of the theories of where the name secretary bird came from. The secretary bird was the bird of the year last year, and now we're going on to the bird of the year for this year, which is the southern ground hornbill. Yes, so another bird of the year titleist. These charismatic southern ground hornbills are also known as the thunderbird. And the reason they've got that nickname is because they are culturally associated with bringing the rains in many of our African cultures. And so they are really revered species and this sort of rain bringing ability offers them a lot of cultural protection in some of our more rural landscapes. So it's not uncommon to see a flock of southern ground hornbills walking through communal grazing lands and sort of passing through with a lot of respect from the, the local people. So it's great that that cultural value has really extended them some protection. Unfortunately, they are also very good at breaking windows. So when too many windows are broken, they are sometimes persecuted, but you can see they are incredible predators capable of taking all sorts of prey. I believe that's a centipede in that one's beak. It's not uncommon to see them walking with scorpions, snakes, chameleons, really amazing amazing birds and very very intelligent and inquisitive so a well-loved species all around i do not know anybody who doesn't admire the southern ground hornbill that's one of their juveniles not as pretty lacking that really red throat sack and you can see in that next photo that the female has a blue throat patch and the juvenile they're watching the female males have an all red throat patch they are fiercely territorial and there will often be um, rather animated conflicts between uh, groups that um, border territories. I suppose it's a good point here just to um, tell everyone that BirdLife South Africa has some amazing Bird of the Year educational materials available on our website. The next bird that we're going to discuss is the Denim's Busted. That is quite a striking bird. Yeah, I, I think this probably rivals the secretary bird for elegance for me. Um, I know Melissa has a special place in her heart for secretary birds, but I really, really enjoy these bustards. And um, they're a little bit smaller than their better known cousins, the Cory bustards, which are the heaviest flying bird, I think. Um, so these are more typical of the grassland rather than the bush belt. And you'll see them often in, in medium height grasslands strolling through the fields. And uh, if you've ever seen these, these ones courtship displaying, which yeah. exactly good timing. There's a photograph of there. They puff out their chest feathers and they just look absolutely magnificent. And it's really quite a thing to see. Yeah, another special bird for me, Andrew. This is my 400th life. You mentioned your okay. life earlier. So I got that out in Vakastrum. Really, really stunning, stunning bird to come across in the field. Now for quite a special bird, and that's the Red's Lock. Yeah, so these are one of our endemic larks. It's part of the Heteromorapha genus, and there are only two species of Heteromorapha larks in the world. And sadly, the other member of this genus is the Liban lark up in Ethiopia. And that bird, I think there are seven individuals left in the world, so it's about to slip off into extinction, sadly, which leaves Rudds as the sole living member of this genus, which is really, really sad, given that these birds are so unique and so special. We find them up in our high altitude grasslands, highly, highly specialized to the types of grasslands that they live in. You can see there on the map, very, very restricted distribution. There's a few birds down in the Eastern Cape as well, but this sort of Northern Berg escarpment grassland is one of the better zones to really find them. So a day trip out of little Switzerland, you could definitely tick Red's Lark off on your list. Um, and really just that bubble head is what gives them away as, as that heteromorapha type lark. 
So you can see quite a large head and they're very upright in the way that they position themselves. And they've got those great eyebrow feathers, which are another giveaway feature for them. Yeah, unfortunately, like it's a close relative, the Rudd's lark is not doing very well, but we are working feverishly to reverse that. And uh, we are involved at the cold face of its conservation in terms of protecting its habitat and also projecting into the future with climate change and land use change on where exactly suitable habitat will remain for these birds and making sure that that is secured for conservation purposes going forward. So not only conserving it in the current, uh, the current day, but also looking forward and, and being proactive about conserving it into the future. The next bird is the yellow-breasted pipits. Yeah, we're really showcasing these uh, endemic LBJs at this point. So our grasslands are full of these wonderful little brown endemic. And when we say endemic, that's a bird that's found nowhere else in the world. So these are endemic birds to our grassland habitats. And you can see just like reds, the yellow-breasted pipit is another high altitude grassland specialist. Um, they have these beautiful yellow breasts and they sadly go a bit browner in winter. So they're easy to mix up with birds like the juvenile Cape Longclaw. There's one that's a female, not as bright as the males, but they have great white outer tail feathers and they breed in grassy tufts. You can see there, they go and look for little insects and bits of grass to line their nests. Wonderful little birds, sadly very impacted by climate change. So our predictions at the moment, we're also working quite hard on this species. We're finding that with the increase in average temperatures across our grasslands during the summertime, these birds are quite sensitive to prolonged hot days. So if we get too many hot days in a row, we're starting to see these birds abandon their nesting territories. So that is a huge concern for us. And as Andrew made the point earlier, it's even more important that we secure that what we call a climate refuge going forward, the areas that will remain suitable for these species and make sure that we're keeping those areas safe going forward in the long term. And the next species on our list is the white starred robin. Now this is quite a special bird for me. And that has been on my list of birds to see and that I've never managed to see. I don't know if you two guys have been able to see them. I've been very, very no, lucky yeah. with this species. <laughs> I've managed to connect with it yeah. a few times, but it's always special whenever you get to see them. Yeah, they are quite striking. As you see, they're beautiful. But what makes it even more interesting is when they start singing or they get excited, they um, expose these white flashes in the neck or around the eyes. In certain individuals, it's in different places. You can see that there's a white spot here or a white spot there. And that's where the name comes from, White Star Robin. So it's actually quite striking where this starts getting excited and it starts calling it, exposes these white flashes. Mm, they are very, very shy birds. And they'll, they'll stick to the very, very thick forest undergrowth. And so the best way to pick them out, I think, actually is on call. So maybe we can play that call. Okay, now we're going to get to one of the special birds, which is um, the Gurney's sugar bird. Um, and as far as I know, this is also endemic, isn't it? You are right. In fact, it's, it's not only endemic, it's a member of an endemic family to South Africa. So what that means is that the Gurney's sugar bird and the closer Cape sugar bird, which is a fangbos specialist, are only found in South Africa and they are the only members of their family to exist in the birding kingdom as we know it. So these are really, really sought after specialists of rocky slope habitats with um, some grass and bigger bushes mixed in. And I, I know them a little less well than their close relatives being based in the Cape, but uh, I have managed to see these a few times on protea species on, in these grassed and uh, slopes in associated rocky areas. Um, international birders who are looking to tick off all the families in the world, and that might sound like a crazy pursuit, but uh, there are quite a few of them out there. Um, and they have to come to South Africa to see this species, which just makes areas like Little Switzerland very, very special in the international context. They're actually the major pollinators for those protea species, so they're very important in the environments in which you find them. And now on to the Drakensberg rock jump. 
Yeah, so another endemic family, as Andrew said, we have two endemic families in South Africa, and this is the other member of our endemic family, the rock jumpers. So it's cousin in the Cape as well as the Cape rock jumper. And then we've got the beautiful Drakensberg rock jumper. The male was just on your screen, and this is the female here, slightly drabber than the boy, following the typical rule of birds. But these guys are great little family living creatures. They live on the rocky slopes in the very high altitude areas, so what we call the alpine areas of the Drakensberg. They really like to be up high in the very chilly conditions, and they live in these rocky habitats. So they nest in the sort of crevices between boulders, and they go looking for little insects growing in between the rocks. And you can see there the female displaying with her tail, often ward off predators using that flashing white tail display and also attract their mates by flashing their tails. Great little birds to come across. And those of you who've traveled up Sani Pass, there's always a nice highlight waiting for you at the top of the hill when you get to the summit. There's a great family of rock jumpers that call that area home. Next we come to probably the most interesting bit for me. Growing up as a child, um, we went to the Darkensburg quite often and this was always a good find. Melissa, you know a lot about them, don't you? Yeah, really, really special birds. So we've got a population down here that calls the Drakensberg home. There are populations up in mainland Europe as well, but our birds down here in the south of Africa are unfortunately critically endangered. So they're one of our most threatened vultures here in South Africa. And what's really unique about these bearded vultures is that they actively target bones. So it's not unusual to see them flying high above the cliffs with a bone in their clutches, and they will then drop that down onto a rock below and let the bone splinter up and they go for the marrow inside the bone. They also like to use red mud as makeup. So you can see on the adults there that nice red wash. Herman's got a juvenile on the, on the screen there, the darker juvenile. But sadly, our population here in South Africa is estimated between only 368 to 408 individuals. So that's between 100 to 200 breeding pairs. So we're really, really worried about these birds. They have, are very specialized to those high altitude Drakensberg cliffs. And sadly, they are very susceptible to things like collisions with power lines and potentially susceptible to wind turbines as well. So BirdLife South Africa was involved in actively preventing a wind turbine installation in the Northern Berg that would have been predicted to just about wipe out our entire population of bearded vultures if it had gone ahead. So we're very grateful that the right conservation legislation was followed and that wind um, farm wasn't established because it really has helped protect and conserve these very special birds down in the Drakensberg. And uh, another interesting fact, uh, again, I'm in the Cape, so I, I find it quite interesting that the historical records of breeding populations of the species in the Cedarberg or the Cedarberg near, near Cape Town. And there was a, a paper that came out literally within the last two weeks by colleagues of ours at the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology. They did a, a, a modeling run to see if the Cedarberg could act as a second population perhaps for a new introduction of the species. So that's really interesting uh, and a really interesting idea, no doubt full of logistical complexity, but uh, maybe we'll see a second population of the species within the country, which would be quite exciting. The next bird, again, like quite a few that we've discussed, is also endemic. This is the ground woodpecker. Yes, uh, this is a very atypical woodpecker, I'd say. Um, if you thought of woodpeckers in your mind, um, this would not be what you conjure up in your imagination. They are entirely terrestrial based. So you'll see they'll perch up on rocks or um, you know, they'll perching spots like this one on the, the cut off tree. And they're actually ant specialists. So they go around uh, picking little ants and termites off uh, rocks. And again, the same kind of rocky slope habitat as the skins and the rock jumpers. And they have, as you can see there, these exceptionally long tongues that they manage to stick into crevices and um, slope up all the ants that they can get. And then the last on our list, if not the least, is the wattled crane. There we go. So wattled crane, sadly another one of our critically endangered species in South Africa. Um, these guys are very much wetland specialists. They 
breed in the, the reed beds of wetlands and you'll often see them grazing or searching for, for small invertebrates and frogs and seeds and tubers along the edges of wetlands and grass grasslands up adjacent to wetlands. They are one of the tallest birds in South Africa, standing at a whopping six feet high. Um, I always get asked, how can you lose a six foot high bird? But uh, they are notoriously <laughs> skulky and difficult to find. Um, occurring in pairs, beautiful birds, and like all the crane species, they have a wonderful dance when they breed. So great to, to behold them when they, do, when they do court each other. Our last of the three destinations tonight is Nibela Lake Lodge. In the map insert, you can see this up near Simangaliso Wetland Park and is kind of squashed in between the Flua and Pelosi, Pinda Nature Reserve and Kuzi Nature Reserve. If you're a birder, you know that this area is one of the best spots in the country for birding in terms of diversity. You get some really fantastic species and fantastic variety in habitats that you can see there. It actually is on the little peninsula, um, as you can see kind of just behind that red uh, map icon uh, that juts out into Lake St. Lucia. So it's fantastically situated. As I said, it's right near or next door to Simangaliso. And the area is dominated by the lake itself, of course. But there's also coastal forest habitats, grasslands and floodplains. So often in summer, these floodplains will, they're, they're essentially grasslands that get a lot of rain and they become completely flooded and inundated with water. And you have some amazing species that move in there and it just becomes an absolute Pandora's box for special birds to see in that area. There's also patches of sand forest available, which is a very scarce habitat type, type in South Africa. And that brings in a few special birds that we'll talk about in due course. And of course, there's the coast itself within striking distance. And you'll probably all know that Sedwana Bay and that whole coastline is one of the best diving sites in the world. Um, Nibela Lodge also has a bird hide on the property, which is really, really great. Um, it's set just on the edge of the lake with some really nice secluded marshy habitats. So they draw in some really cool species close to the lodge. Okay, in terms of the birds of Nibela, we've said that it's quite interesting species that you find here that you don't find anywhere else in South Africa. And the first one, the white eared barbet. Yeah, so this is the only chocolate brown barbet in our region and these guys are family living birds so you'll see them in little family groups of about five to seven birds they are fruit eaters like all of our barbets and they nest in cavities as you can see in that picture over there they're quite an easy barbet to see if you're in the right habitat so they enjoy those coastal forests and if you spend much time in the Umtanzini area they are very very common birds all along that northern Zululand region you can see the distribution they're very much centered on that coastal lowland forest and then we move on to the african broadbill yeah so this is a very sought after species um, quite isolated in its distribution there's some really interesting little patches of its distribution across south africa uh, the first one i ever came across was in galway forest which is up near this um, sort of vendor area in northern, you can see the little X there just to the left of Toyando. So really special, uh, special little bird and well known for its uh, display call. It'll perch on a branch and as it takes off, it does a little and then lands back on the branch. As Melissa said, they, they have this little flight that accompanies it where they're, they're sitting on the branch and then they do literally a little somersault around the branch and then come back and perch in the same spot. Now, one of the most striking of South African birds, the African emerald cuckoo. I mean, just look at that photograph. It is a stunning, stunning bird. Um, that, that green contrasting with that lemon or canary yellow underneath the belly. Um, and it, it also, in, it is quite uh, visually stimulating, but when you hear it as well, it's got a very uh, charismatic call, which is likened to the phrase, hello, Georgie. And you'll often hear that again from the top of the canopy uh, shouting away and it can be, despite it's, it's very bright coloring against the forest backdrop, it can be quite difficult to see. And the females as well are quite uh, dull compared to the males. And uh, they also can be quite difficult to spot and, and sometimes difficult to identify from other female cuckoos, which can look quite similar. 
The next bird is the black-throated wattle eye, one of these interesting birds because of the little wattle around the eye. And one of there's some evolutionary reason for it, probably more for, for attracting mates than anything else. They are pretty much dense bush birds. I've just seen them up in Pafuri quite a few times. And they're always high up in the trees, always very difficult to, to actually photograph because they never sit still. They always jump around. It's actually quite a feat to get them sitting still like this. I'm very jealous of these photographers that have been able to get it. Yeah, my experience has certainly been, you know, usually in a pair, um, these birds, but punched away deep in the shadows, evading the camera. That's my typical experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You also see that the male and the female is quite different. The one has got a, a solid black throat and the other one has got a band across the chest. And now for the green Malkoa. Yes, another forest specialist. Again, you'll see there it's a very, very limited distribution within the northeastern corner of South Africa. Uh, but the Bella Peninsula is a good place to see it. You want to be looking for coastal forests and coastal forest edge habitats where they will be making their kind of nasal call um, that you can pick up on and slowly kind of pinpoint exactly where the bird is. Yes, so this bird is also known as the green kukul and it's mostly gray with a green back and this obvious, obvious yellow beak. The southern banded snake eagle. This is the first bird of prey that we've actually discussed so far. Other than the secretary bird. <laughs> oh, yes, so this is another, another species that's very close to my heart. So I was previously the raptor and large terrestrial bird project manager at BirdLife South Africa. And one of the species that I poured a lot of my energy into is the critically endangered southern banded snake eagle. Now, these are the apex predators of our coastal forest habitats. They are only found in northern KwaZulu-Natal and northwards along the east coast of mainland Africa. You can see very restricted little distributions here in South Africa. They rely heavily on coastal forests to breed. And then in the mornings, you'll often find them perching on the edge of those forest patches, watching for snakes and reptiles moving along. About 80% of their diet is made up of reptiles. So very, very much earning their name of the snake eagle. Sadly, we estimate that there are fewer than 50 mature individuals left within South Africa. So a highly threatened species. Um, they fall foul of electrocutions on transformer boxes. We had a great um, successful project with ESCOM where we managed to identify 62 high-risk transformer boxes last year. And we managed to get those fitted with electrocution mitigation devices to prevent future southern banded snake eagles from being electrocuted in northern Zululand. So we're very glad that we could pull that off with ESCOM. And hopefully this will go a long way to preventing a very unnecessary threat. And the next species that we're going to talk about is the Livingston's Turaco. Now the Turacos are some of my favorite birds. I mean, they are so gaudy, it's ridiculous. I mean, look at that crest. I mean, it's, they almost appear arrogant. They're so good looking. Um, <laughs> maybe I'm just jealous. I don't know. Um, but they are fantastic birds. Uh, and they, one of the interesting things about them is they're the only bird to produce a true red pigment. So this is called Turacin, and it's named after the Turacos. This, this bird, Livingston's Turaco, is a specialist in those forests up in northern KZN. It's quite similar to the Nisner Turaco, but if you look at them side by side, you can see there's quite a difference in the shape of the crest. So this one is a very erect crest, very upright, and it has this white fringe to the crest, which gives it a kind of crowned um, effect. Um, when, you, when they fly as well, You'll see just in that top photograph, there's a red flight feathers. And when they take off, it's like an explosion of um, red, red coloration as they fly. It's, it's quite spectacular. The Niergaard sunbird, again, one of those little birds that you only get in very small distribution here. Yeah, so another one of our endemics to the subregion, really specialized little sunbird. 
um, found in our, our sand forests and those dry coastal forests that you get in northern Zululand and southern Mozambique. What's really interesting about these little birds is that they use a species of old man's beard moss to build their nests. And so you'll often find these beautifully, beautifully constructed little sunbird nests with a whole lot of moss draped around them. But uh, there you can see pictures of the nest. Just absolutely gorgeous um, and highly sought after endemic species of sunbird. Okay, then next we get to the very interesting looking crested guinea fowl. Yeah, and what's not to love about these incredibly charismatic birds? I mean, just look at that hairdo. The envy of anyone in lockdown, I'm sure. You can't get perlers like that. But uh, <laughs> these wonderful uh, forest living guinea fowl are often found in these family flocks. And what's really cool about them, if you have a look at that um, photograph, you can see a bit of a blue sheen on that wing. If you manage to find a feather of a crested guinea fowl, it actually has these wonderful little blue outlines to the dots. So unlike the helmeted guinea fowl, which just has a plain black and white feather, the feathers of the crested guinea fowl actually have a blue tint to those white spots. So keep an eye out when you're walking through the forest and don't just dismiss any feather that you find. You may just pick up the crested guinea fowl's feather with those beautiful blue tints to them. But uh, definitely that hairdo is what is charismatic for these birds. Quite interesting. Looks like the typical, you know, granny perm. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and then the rosy-throated longkey. Now this is probably considered the Nebula Peninsula special in South Africa. This is the best place to see it and one of the only places to see it. So I would encourage you to uh, look up uh, one of BirdLife South Africa's community bird guides to take you to one of these floodplains where these rosy-throated long claws thrive. Um, I haven't actually seen one myself despite wading for hours through a floodplain at about the waist deep. So again, one of those bogeys that I've tried for but haven't got. But it's uh, quite an attractive long claw. You'll see it's obvious where it's got its name from, the rosy throat. And yeah, that, that black bib as well is quite striking in contrast to that red throat. But, so a real Nibela Peninsula special. And one, if you do visit the lodge, you must make sure to make an effort to go and see it. Then the pink-backed pelican. This is a picture that I took actually years ago, um, waiting in Durban of all places, in the Ngeni River, trying to get to this to this bird was one of those only one-off pictures that you get and then it flies off and I was so fortunate to get it and to see it um, one of my most special photographs just by the way uh, just because it was so hard to 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 get to the bird um, fantastic yeah. capture mm -hmm. yeah wow. really stunning shot Herman. St. Lucia is probably the place where you would most likely see them of any place in South Africa Okay, then we get to the blue-cheeked bee-eater. Yes, so South Africa is blessed with a number of different bee-eater species. This is one of those that you will find on the Nebela Peninsula. This is the blue-cheeked bee-eater. And you can kind of see that blue coloration around the face. It's mostly a green bird, actually, with uh, some bluish tones on the back and on the wings. And then this kind of chestnut and yellow underneath the chin, as well as the white around the face and around the beak. Um, really, really striking little birds. I think they probably rival the kingfishers for, you know, the, the jewel type group in South, South and Southern Africa. They're usually quite colorful, quite uh, distinctive and charismatic as well. You'll see them in flights, like a picture slightly below, uh, hawking insects midair. Um, it's quite spectacular, some of the flight behavior that they display. They're very, very skilled uh, flyers and hunters of, of insects like bees and flies and especially at uh, emergences of insects after good rains you'll see termite colonies taking flight and lots of bees swooping around and, and eating up the termite alates as well. You see that the distribution they are migratory birds as well so you'll see that um, they do change throughout the year so if you want to see them it's best to go in the summer months. Yeah, it's probably worth mentioning at this point um, that birding in 
I'd say probably all three of the destinations is excellent all year round, but especially good in the late spring, summer time when the migrants are around, the birds are breeding, all the birds are calling. And um, that's probably when the best time is for birding at all three destinations. But again, I think all year round, these are really prime birding destinations within South Africa. Absolutely. The lemon-breasted canary. Yes, so this is, again, quite a, a different canary um, to some of the others that you might find around, like the yellow fronteds. Um, they are kind of duller. They have these black, gray, smudgy kind of markings around the face. And then this lemon yellow colored breast, which gives them their name. That one, you can see the males also have a little bit of yellow that extends up the neck and into the face. These are quite specialist in their habitat choice. So they are mostly found around what we call raffia palms. So if you, if you want to see these birds, the best way to do it is to find a suitable patch of habitat and then work it until you can find them moving around, feeding on the little pods around the palm trees. So then we get to probably the most beautiful looking um, vulture that you get in South Africa, the white-headed vulture. Yeah, so these beautiful white-headed vultures have sadly become the poster child for Africa's vulture crisis. And I say crisis because sadly our vultures really are in trouble. I think of the eight species of vulture in South Africa, every single one of them is endangered, if not critically endangered. Um, the only one who's not heavily threatened is the palm nut vulture, which is one of the species that we can also associate to this area, but haven't managed to squeeze into this list. But sadly, our vultures are being threatened by a myriad of threats from poisoning to habitat loss, to straight out um, poaching for traditional medicine. Um, this species in particular is critically endangered. It's estimated that we only have around 100, 160 mature individuals left in South Africa, and those are largely restricted to the Kruger National Park and the north of Zululand, one or two birds left in that area. Um, if you come across a, a kill in Kruger, when you're very, very lucky, you might get one of these individuals showing up at the kill, and there'll be many more other species of vulture there. But BirdLife South Africa is working very, very hard to save our vultures, and we're collaborating with a number of partners across Africa and across the world to try and save these wonderful birds because we don't want to see our ecosystem cleanup system taken out by all of the threats that they face. Well, that brings us to the last species, and that is the broad billed roller. Yeah, so we're going to end on a happy note. These are one of my absolute favorites to come across in the big, what we call riparian zone. So those are your big forest trees along watercourses. Um, I particularly associate them with the Anna tree or the Fidobia albida, which are these big um, river loving trees. And they are cavity nesters, so they build their nests in the holes in these big trees along the rivers and really just an absolute gem of a bird to, to see perched out like their cousins, the purple roller that we spoke about earlier. They'll sit and hawk insects and have this wonderful uh, display where they throw their wings out like that and croak at each other. Um, also typical of the rollers, they do that rolling display mid-air. So you can see there where they call from high above and then slowly descend, rolling from side to side with their wings. Mm, interesting, these rollers, despite being really, really good looking, are not uh, very kind to the ear. You know, they can't look good and sound good at the same time. That would be kind of unfair, I think. So <laughs> the, rollers, the rollers, I think, to a species have, have rather rough, kind of gurgly, cackly type calls, and they don't really reflect the way they look. Absolutely. They do travel around quite a bit. I know that they, they saw some here in Johannesburg as well. Um, yeah, there's one in Emerentia not too long ago. I think I went and touched that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that uh, brings us to the end of our evening's webinar. Thank you so much for taking a journey with us and a big thank you to Dream Hotels and Resorts as well as the Bird Pro app for partnering with BirdLife South Africa to bring you this great virtual tour of some of South Africa's absolutely incredible birding spots. And I'd just like to thank my fellow panelists, Andrew and Herman, for sharing your amazing knowledge for the country's birds. And Herman, thank you for, for showcasing that wonderful app of yours. I hope everybody goes out and purchases their license for that app. I believe it's available on the Apple and the 
Android stores as well. So please everyone support Bird Pro, it's a great resource. And uh, you can see all of our social media and contact information on the screen. Please do reach out to us if you have any questions. And thank you all for spending your Thursday night with us. If you enjoyed this webinar and you'd like to find out a little bit more about birds and conservation, you can also join Conservation Conversations every Tuesday night. And you can click on the website down at the bottom, birdlife.org.za slash BLSA conversations to find out more. So thanks everybody for joining us and we'll now take some questions. Please remember you can type them into the Q&A box and we'll read them out and answer them. So the Q&A box is on your Zoom screen. Just click on the little Q&A toggle and we'll start answering any questions that you have. Thanks. Well, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I'm definitely feeling very list to get back to the bush belt. And uh, I really just need to say thank you very much again to, to Herman and Andrew. A lot of hard work went into putting this webinar together. And I'm not sure if Brent is still with us or not, but uh, thank you I very am. much. <laughs> Great. <laughs> good, good, Brent. Thank you so much to Dream Hotels and Resorts for sort of getting this ball rolling. Um, I know Herman and the Bird Pro app team and the Dream Hotels and Resorts team approached us to put this together. So. Thank you to everyone for all the hard work in making this happen. And I'm really looking forward to hopefully joining a few of you out in these amazing birding destinations that have been showcased this evening. We are happy to take some questions and I see a number of you are typing them into that Q&A box. If you're listening to us through Facebook, please feel free to um, type your questions in on the Facebook comment feed. We are keeping an eye on those as well. Um, Herman, I'm just going to go to one of the questions that was answered earlier on in the in the debate. Um, speaking about Bird Pro's performance when you don't have cell phone connectivity, would you mind just sharing that with um, with everyone? The answer that you gave to that question. Yeah, sure. Um, so Bird Pro works totally offline, um, except for you know obviously when you buy it, you have to download it the first time. But after that, it's totally offline. Um, the only thing that you need to have Connectivity for is obviously also syncing your sightings with the server, but the rest is all offline. Fantastic. And um, we've got a question from Britain asking, would the Bird Pro app ever go global and have the same features it currently has on a global scale? That sounds like quite an undertaking, Herman. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for offering to help us there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we'd love to. We'd love to expand it. Uh, firstly, to the to the neighbouring countries, we've had quite a few requests for that. Um, but also, you know, well, we'll have to see. We'll have to see if if there's a market in the rest of the world as well. For sure. Um, Daniela is asking if you purchase the app, but you get a new phone, can you transfer that license across, um, or do you have to purchase it again? No, you can transfer as long as the, as long as you've got both devices registered with the same email address, you can transfer it. The only caveat is that you cannot transfer between Apple and Android. Uh, they are unfortunately not in the same um, boat. We've got a question from Paul Herman, and he's asking whether you'd ever bring in the picture recognition software. Yeah, we looked at that. Um, we're actually more keen to bring in call recognition at the moment. So we've started investigating that. Um, it's quite a daunting task, but it's something that we're definitely very keen to do and, um, and have already started investigating. So hopefully that'll come soon. Absolutely. Right, I'm not seeing any other questions. Andrew, I don't know if you've picked up any on Facebook. Lots of thank yous and people seem to have enjoyed this one. Great, so Brent, I hope we gave your properties a, a good showing there. I'm certainly dying to get out and visit every single one of them at the end of this. <laughs> so I'm gonna be booking my spot there as soon as we can travel out of Gauteng's borders. <laughs> Fantastic, thanks Melissa. Yeah, and please, uh, we would love to have everyone all our listeners all you guys um i know i had a lot of uh, of our kind of uh, property gms commenting saying they'd love you love you guys to come there and be there so when we open we'd love to have you so thank you brilliant sounds like we need some bird life themed weekends off at these amazing places andrew mr av tourism i'm launching that onto your to-do list <laughs> <laughs> i've made a made a record of it already fantastic <laughs> 
We have, okay. we have friends that have invitation on, on, on record. On now. record. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> sorry, my video. I, th I think, Melissa, you switched my video off. So that's why I'm. Oh, not, shame. Uh, sorry, Brent. Face, but uh, not to worry. Um, cool. But absolutely, guys. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. No worries. All right. Thank you, everybody. I think we're going to. Say goodnight, there's Brent. <laughs> Sorry I'm about that, Brent. <laughs> from Birdco, also thanks to BirdLife for your, for your platform. We really appreciate that. Absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for letting us uh, play around on your incredible piece of technology. I think it worked very well for this webinar. So thank you and thank you, Brent. We'll definitely well done, be guys. chatting to everyone again soon. Have a safe evening, everybody, and take care as the cold weather rolls in. Awesome. Good night well, and thanks, you. everyone. Good night, guys. Good night.